Kim Alexander, and I teach at Model Laboratory School at Eastern Kentucky University. And with me today is Dr. Frank Edinson, who is a geology professor at the University of Kentucky. We've come to Letcher County today to bring you a segment on our Earth Science Teacher Development Series to allow you to have some Kentucky geology and physiography that you might not otherwise get to view. But I think Dr. Hettinson would agree with me, the best place to start this view is at the top of the mountain. You're right. Let's, let's go. You might notice here we're on a, on a high hill, and it's high because of these sandstones that we're walking up. Nice kind of white to gray sandstones. There's uh, quartz pebbles in these things. Mm -hmm. And these ridges stand up the way they do because of the resistance that these sandstones offer to weathering and erosion. And they are very tough. Well, Kim, we're, we're sitting here on, uh, on the top of Pine Mountain, right where uh, US 23 cuts through the mountain, right near the Kentucky-Virginia state line. Uh, looking here uh, northwestward, actually, into Kentucky. And you'll notice out in front of you, uh, we have an area where all the hilltops are approximately at the same elevation. This is called the Appalachian Plateau. And of course, although when you're down on the ground, you know it's pretty hilly, it's called a plateau because all the ridge tops are at about the same elevation. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at a map, it'll tell you that that's about 2,000 feet high down there, 2,000, maybe 2,200 feet high. But we're up 1,000, maybe, maybe 800 feet above that here on Pine Mountain. So Pine Mountain is a part of the Appalachian Plateau, uh, but it's uh, considerably higher uh, than the rest of that area. Can you explain for us, Frank, what internal for forces in the Earth actually caused the mountain to raise above the plateaus? Well, this is a, let me explain what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a, 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 a fault block, and this fault block is about 125 miles long. And uh, what happened uh, maybe about 240 million years ago, uh, a continent called Gondwana which today includes, would include part of South America, parts of Africa, Antarctica, Australia, but the African and South American parts of that continent collided with the eastern and southeastern part of North America. And so you have one plate literally colliding with another. You imagine a car accident where two cars are colliding, the same thing happens, and the tremendous force of that collision basically causes the other continent, the colliding continent, and sometimes the, the continent causing the collision to buckle up on the margins. And a lot of that buckling um, is transmitted in toward the center of that continent in the form of large folds and thrust faults uh, like this one which we're sitting on. So this is a pretty common phenomenon in our history. Yes, it really, any mountain range or most mountain ranges are, are formed in this way, basically, where we have continents colliding and they produce basically an uplifted, buckled up series of rocks. And of course, this is all happening uh, sometimes several miles below the surface of the Earth. And at that distance below the surface, these rocks are under tremendous pressure and also they're heated up to some degree. And so these rocks are effectively almost plastic. Mm -hmm. And so when this tremendous force is pushed on them, they literally buckle and, 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 and break. And that's very common in, in most mountain belts of the world. Now we're sitting on one of the older mountain belts, aren't we, um, in comparison to some of the other mountain ranges that are across our continent? Well, certainly on this continent, the Appalachians are one of the, one of the older mountain belts. And we, we said, uh, the collision that caused this to go up occurred uh, somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of uh, about 240, maybe 230 million years ago. How much of this road cut exposes uh, that, that age period? How, how old is this? Well, the rocks in, in this road cut uh, range in age from, from Devonian we have the uppermost Devonian, which is about 365 million years, and includes all the uh, Mississippian 
time period, and it includes the basal part of the Pennsylvania. And the basal part of the Pennsylvania here may be 210 to 211 million years old like this. Uh, so um, some of these sands may represent just the beginning of the collision. And that's where these sands, the sands that we're sitting on, were eroded from mountains that were rising further to the east during the initial stages of this collision. Okay. Um, so that's part of what makes this area so spectacular and unique for us is the fact that we actually can look through geologic history here. Exactly. I mean, each of these layers is, is like a page in a, in a textbook. And uh, unfortunately, in some textbooks, students rip out pages. Well, nature has ripped out some with some of these faults and, uh, and things of this sort. But each one of these layers is like the page in the textbook. And uh, the position of those books of those layers tells us something as well about what they've been through time. So as we go down actually on the face of the road cut, we'll, we'll be able to see some of the features that uh, make this area so unique and make it such a good example of so many geologic processes. Exactly. We'll see uh, different rocks stacked on top of each other and we'll be able to say something about time. Uh, we'll see uh, different rock units. Uh, you, you can see right away that some of them are of different colors and each of those rock units represents a different depositional environment uh, ranging from relatively deep seas to, to shallow rivers, very shallow rivers, and of course the, the, the orientation of those rocks. Uh, uh, these are dipping here versus some of the flat ones out in front of us tell us something about how these rocks were later deformed during these mountain building events. And economically speaking, from the perspective that we were looking at earlier, you pointed out there's some, some flatter areas, and part of those flatter areas weren't actually part of the original landscape, were they? Yeah, uh, originally this was all pretty, pretty hilly, uh, pretty hilly topography, and of course the, the youngest rocks here are Pennsylvanian, and, and the Pennsylvanian rocks in Kentucky are known for its coal. There's a lot of coal and uh, a lot of the flat areas represent former strip benches where they went in, took out the, the coal, leaving behind these, these flat benches which were later reclaimed. And that's very unnatural uh, for this area. Uh, and in fact, when a lot of the mining initially started, the flattest areas were down in the valleys. And that's why many of the little towns are located on the valleys. Now, of course, a lot of the flat areas are up high. And uh, uh, that, People might later on go ahead and use those for industrial parks and maybe place to place big school complexes or something of that sort. But a lot of the communities are, are located low down in the valleys because initially that was the only flat terrain uh, to be had. And so actually we can see the progression here because as you pointed out on the far side, there's, there's an area that, that's actually currently being reclaimed and then a couple of areas that are already reclaimed. Uh, exactly. And you can uh, compare the... Uh, the elevation of that with the elevation we've got right here and, and get some idea also about the, the, uh, the difference between Pine Mountain and the rest of the Appalachian uh, Plateau area. Well, Frank, we've come back down the mountain now and we're at the base of it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are in real time and then compare it to geologic time. Okay, well, in, in real time, we're near the junction of highways 15 and 23, right at the base of the, uh, of the Pound Gap uh, exposure. In fact, uh, Pound Gap goes, the expo road goes up and over uh, the exposure where we were earlier. And we're about a half mile from the Kentucky-Virginia border. And in fact, we're just over the hill from the town of Jenkins. Now in geological time, it's another story. Uh, we are on the opposite side of the thrust fault. Uh, on the la last time we talked, we were actually on, on the other side, but we're on the lower plate of the thrust fault. And if I can use my hands to illustrate, basically, initially we started out with a series of layers that were kind of horizontal, just like my hands are trying to be. And when we get compression coming from the east, which is gonna be over here, basically, what happens, it breaks, and as it tries to move, it forces the layers up under it and overturns them in the process before it rides up over it. So we're in a series of really messed up rocks on the lower side of that thrust fault. 
And you can see how all these layers are badly broken up. They look like they're in little square or angular chunks. That reflects the faulting. But also, interestingly, these rocks are not horizontal. Now, we said before that um, basically on the lower side, these rocks should be horizontal, but obviously they're not too horizontal. They're sure not. And of course, these rocks have been overturned as that upper plate overrode the lower one. So the law of superposition tells us then, Frank, that these older rocks should be under the, the more recent rocks, but that's not the case here, is it? E exactly. Uh, we actually have older rocks here overlying younger rocks. And can you explain how you can visually describe why that is? Well, there are a number of ways we can tell. There are two ways of, that are apparent to me here, just uh, kind of looking at this exposure. If you uh, look at this little sandstone, this little wedge-shaped uh, kind of tan sandstone, and that there is a black layer running on top of that. Now, that black layer is actually a coal, and at least part of that coal was deposited in a little valley. In fact, if you follow this black layer up, you see a little bump. Uh, the coal looks like it gets a little thicker, and there's a little bump. That little bump is actually a little channel. And you think about channels, you don't expect it, uh, channels to be convex up or bump-wise. You expect them to be concave down or with the open part up. And so when we look at that little bump, uh, that's just counter to the way it should be. So what you're saying then, Frank, is that we've got something that looks like a hill and it really should look like a valley. Exactly, exactly. So that's one of the things that tells us that these layers are upside down. Now the other, if we can come down from that little bump right down here to the bottom of the exposure, and you see that black coal in there, you can see that real clearly. Now remember, coal is deposited from a swamp. It's a swamp vegetation, and that vegetation grows on some sort of a soil or underlying clay soil. And so and it, when these things are preserved, we call these clays underclays. So ideally, that underclay ought to be on the bottom of the coal. But if you look, we see the dark coal, and then we see the kind of gray clay layer on top of it. And so that also tells us that these rocks have been overturned, uh, just contrary to the law of, uh, of uh, original horizontality or superposition. So in reality, the, the layers that we saw up at the top of the mountain are more as it should be, so to speak. Exactly. They're in normal position, although they're, they're dipping at an angle. Mm -hmm. And we know that the raw law of original horizontality tells us those things ought to be horizontal. They are in correct order, unlike these rocks, but they are dipping at about 25 to 30 degrees. So describe for us, Frank, what conditions might have created this mess. Well, a lot of intense pressure. Uh, again, we had this upper plate literally riding up over the lower plate, and it literally dragged the lower plate up and totally overturned it in this area. And you see a fault, for example. There's all sorts of little faults. There's a, a, a fault that actually cuts off this little tabular shaped sandstone bed. You see the sandstone comes up and then abruptly ends. Well, that shouldn't happen. That layer should go on, but it abruptly ends and it's cut off by a little fault. And actually a lot of these kind of uh, fractures in, uh, are, are actually tiny little faults. So this whole outcrop is literally fractured and sheared up uh, by the intense pressure uh, that was generated when this fault moved. Now you've made some um references to the different types of rock that we find here. Can you tell us a little bit more about them individually? Well, sure. If, if we can go up to the outcrop, we can, we can have a, a closer look at some of these rocks. Let's just start o over here, and I'm going to pull out my hammer here. Uh, we have three, three major kinds of rocks in this outcrop, and you see this real soft-looking stuff in here. Now, uh, part of this is it's soft because that's the way the rock is. Another reason it's soft is because it's been all sheared up by the, by the fault. But uh, you see this real soft looking rock? And it crumbles really easily. This is a rock that we call shale. Uh, one of the outstanding characteristics of shale is, is what we call its facility. 
And facility is a fancy word for very thin bedding. And you see yeah, how thin, thin uh, very thinly layered this stuff is. And it's also pretty soft. I mean, mm -hmm. I can take and break it. Mm -hmm. And shale is composed primarily of clay. And most shales will, will not fizz with acid. You may remember uh, from our course that uh, uh, acid is one way of telling limestone from a lot of the other rocks. Right. So let's hope if I put acid on this thing, it doesn't fizz. Okay. Some shales do, it most will it. not. And so here's a little acid. Ah, it behaved just the way most shales mm -hmm. should. You see it didn't fizz. No fizzing. And that tells us that this shale is composed almost wholly of clay. Okay. Let's talk about the particle size a bit. I know that's one of the characteristics of sedimentary rocks that, that most people don't realize is that the, the grain size in it is actually how we determine uh, a lot of the qualities that w it will have and therefore its identification. So shale is very common in Kentucky and it has a fine coarse what type of Extremely size? fine particle size in, in shales. In fact the particles are so small that we can't see them with our naked eye. Okay. And that's a, what we call a clay size. Okay. And uh, sometimes there may be silt in these things, but silt is also small enough that we can't feel it. Now, I'll tell you the way we tell if there's silt in something like this. Go ahead, do it. You uh, want to do it? No, you go right we ahead. We take a little <laughs> bit of this, we take a little bit of this and put it between our teeth. Mmm, tastes good. <laughs> and you can feel the grit between your teeth, but you can't feel it with your fingers. Now, I, this is silty shale, pardon me. <laughs> Pardon me, but uh, this is a silty shale, and that's the only way we can tell the presence of silt is by putting it between our teeth and biting down on it. The texture. Yeah, the, the texture, and you feel that little grit in between mm -hmm. your teeth. I remember doing that well. I'm glad you didn't make me do it today. <laughs> well, maybe well, next time. So, okay, what about this sandstone behind us? Okay, well, as we move down the section, remember I, I can say down because, in fact, these rocks are overturned, so the older rocks, or we say down section, are in this way, but as we move down section, we have another kind of rock here, and Kim has very aptly identified it, if I can pull a piece out without pulling the hillside down on me, it's sandstone. Now, um, this is not a very picturesque sandstone. Um, There's some much nicer specimens I'll tell you on what, the ground below Can I ask us. Kim to go over and lug me that, that big, big piece, piece, that white piece over there? Because this is really, or take the small piece up above, up, yeah. There we go. Okay. That's a much We're, prettier piece. Yeah, this is it? a much prettier piece. I'm going to drop this one. But this is, is sandstone, and sandstone is a rock composed of sand-sized grains of, of quartz or maybe other rock fragments. This one is almost totally quartz. And um, this, the grains are large enough that we can seal them, see them, and we can actually break them off sometimes, and we can actually feel feels the, gritty. Yeah. And we can actually feel. This one is not the, the best cemented because mm -hmm. it does break off. But this is, is a nice sandstone. Now, many sandstones will fizz because there's calcite cement cementing the little sand grains together. I'm, I'm going to bet that this one does not fizz. I'm going to stop you, you, you a minute and ask you while I'm checking for it fizzing, is uh, calcite a mineral or a rock? Well, calcite is actually a mineral. Okay. And calcite is a mineral that's a common cement in sedimentary rocks. And you see Kim put that on there, and it soaked it up, mm -hmm. but it didn't fizz. So this is a, a pretty typical, uh, we say, a non-calcareous. That means there's no calcite in it, a non-calcareous uh, sandstone that's very typical of a lot of the Pennsylvania rocks that we see associated with the uh, what's called the coal measures. In, in eastern Kentucky. Is this like the sandstones that we saw on the cap of the mountain? Exactly. Uh, a little, uh, probably a little bit older, or, I'm sorry, a little bit younger in age, but very much like those sandstones. Those Similar. are probably a little bit coarser than this, actually. Okay. And what about this layer of coal beyond us? Okay, well, again, you very rightly identified this as coal. Um, see this nice dark color. Now, uh, this is a, a, a bituminous coal, but boy, it looks a lot different than many bituminous coals. You'd normally expect kind of a dull looking color. And you see this is very shiny. And when I look at it, I see some little lines on there that we call slick sides. And this coal is so shiny basically because it's been tectonized or it's been moved, it's been sheared along a fault zone. 
It's and, been pushed together very yeah. tightly there. And in, instead of a blocky kind of nature you'd expect to see in a coal, this is all sheared up and literally just breaks up in, into tiny fragments. We can just take a mm -hmm. handful of this mm -hmm. stuff and you can see it just, it just breaks up. And this is coal that's been sheared uh, uh, along one of these faults that's in, in here. Now, economically, this is a medium-grade kind of coal, isn't it? It's not as good quality as the next type that we probably won't see around here is anthracite, correct? Yeah, well, we wouldn't see anthracite in this area, uh, but uh, uh, looking at the size of this little seam, this little seam is at most uh, two feet thick, uh, in most places a lot less thick, uh, thicker than that, and so just on the basis of thickness, it wouldn't be a very, very worthwhile seam to mine. And uh, we don't know how far it extends. Uh, sometimes they like to have very extensive seams. And also it is, it's pretty broken up and tectonized and we've got pieces of the clay mixed up in with us. So it would not be a very economical coal to, to mine. Okay, and where's coal come from besides the swamps that you described in the Pennsylvania? What, what materials make up coal? Well, coal is largely carbon. Um, and this is a rock. Many people think of coal as a mineral mm -hmm. and it's in uh, mineral sections and things like this, but coal is actually a rock. It's composed largely of carbon, but there are other minerals associated with it. Sometimes there's quartz, sometimes there's little bits and pieces of pyrite, uh, sometimes there's other minerals in it, things like sphalerite. Some t uh, so uh, this is really a rock. Uh, not a mineral. Okay, so let's stop right there and make sure that everyone understands the difference between a rock and a mineral. Okay, well, a, uh, let's start with a mineral. Okay. A mineral, first off, is a natural occurring substance. And we make man-made diamonds and quartz and things like that. Technically, that, that's no longer a mineral. Uh, so it's, it's a naturally occurring substance. But a mineral also has a definite chemical composition. Okay. It's inorganic. Okay. So right from the start, this is organic. That rules out coal. And it rules out coal right, right off the bat. So it's naturally occurring, inorganic, and has a natural uh, composition and, and a, a definite set of physical properties. And that's the way we define a mineral, generally speaking. A rock, on the other hand, is a naturally occurring combination of one or more minerals. And again, we can go back to use this sandstone as, as a nice example. We know and we can see, I don't know if the viewers can see, but there's just millions upon millions yes, of grains of sand in there. And so each one of those is a little crystal of quartz and they're all cemented together. So this is a naturally occurring aggregate or combination of minerals okay. cemented together, in this case, not by calcite, but by probably by silica. Okay. Well, I guess the next thing we should do then is start to look at the different layers in their uh, order of sequence is that we move up the road cut and I think that we will probably uh, go there next. Okay, we'll, we'll see many more of these different rock units. Now we've moved to the base of the road cut and Frank, I know one thing we discussed earlier was the type of rocks at the base of the mountain and we mentioned sedi uh, sedimentary rocks and I'd like to make sure that the people that are watching this realize that Kentucky is primarily sedimentary rock. Yeah, about 99.9% uh, .9 of Kentucky is, in fact, sedimentary rock. We have a few metamorphic rocks, some fault zones, and we have a few igneous rocks in, in, in eastern Kentucky, but uh, almost all of Kentucky is, in fact, sedimentary. So all these rocks that we're going to be looking at along the road cut are entirely sedimentary. Yeah, everything here. And a sedimentary rock, again, of course, is a rock that's deposited in a fluid. Now, we may have the fluids may be air, commonly ice or water and in this case all the rocks we're looking at were deposited in, 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 a, in a water. And I know you mentioned at the top of the mountain that there were uh, varying depths of water as time passed on over many of these rock layers. Yeah the rocks at the very top were basically very shallow what we call fluvial or river deposited sediments. Now we're down at the oldest rocks on this exposure and these were deposited in rather very in deep open marine conditions. In fact so deep that a lot of the organic matter was preserved and some people uh, suggest that these seas were, were stagnant because of the abundant organic matter. But why don't we walk up and take a look at some of these these uh, deeper water sediments okay. and uh, we'll, we'll see how right. stagnant they were. 
Well, Kim, we're at a contact, actually, between two different kinds of rocks and between two geologic periods. You're standing on Devonian rocks. I'm standing on Mississippian rocks. Now, how do you know that? Well, um, I've, I've been here before and worked <laughs> on this, but in, in other places, people have looked at the fossils. Okay. And we know that fossils represent the remains of organisms which have evolved through time and by looking at evolutionary sequences of organisms and comparing them all over the world, we know the approximate age of these rocks. Okay. And so this contact between the gray the, shales that you're standing, that on standing on and the black shales I'm standing, this is the Devonian, this is the Devonian Mississippian boundary. Now the Devonian is oldest, that's about 365 million years old where you're standing, and I'm just a few million years younger where I'm standing. And the rock types are interesting. If we look at the Devonian things. Well, Frank, that doesn't even really look like rock. Yeah, this, this, is a, this is a clay shale. This is a shale that's composed primarily of clay. And if we put this between our teeth, I'd like okay, you to do it this time. you want me to do it this time, okay. I'm gonna show I'm not shy about doing this. I did do this all last summer. Now, you shouldn't feel much in the way of silt. Nope. This should be kind of a, a gooey, greasy kind of mm -hmm. feeling between your teeth. And this is a shale, but it's a clay shale, and you can see it just kind of crumbles. Now, this is the Devonian stuff. This is a different formation. It's a different age. Now, I'm standing on the black stuff. I'm going to go up and get a piece of it. This is Mississippian. This is a, a black shale, and this is very organic-rich rock. And when we have a lot of black rocks like this, the blackness generally means it's organic rich. So this has got lots of old uh, remnants of living organisms in it, and would we expect to find any fossils in this? Very, very few. In They've fact, decomposed. Well, they decomposed, but probably organisms didn't live in this stuff. This okay. was deposited in very deep waters, and in very deep waters like this, it, there's very little oxygen. In fact, the fact that we have so much organic matter suggests that there's very little oxygen in these waters. So okay. we very rarely find fossils in these rocks. And when we do, there are organisms that lived way up on the top of the water column, and they fell down into the bottom. I know a lot of people's misconception, Frank, would be to pick this up and assume that it was the metamorphosed form of shale, which is slate. How would I know this is not slate? Well. Number one, we're in Kentucky. That's <laughs> the best reason right there. That's the easiest way. But uh, this is, in fact, very slaty. It rings like slate, uh, but it is a black shale. And a lot of the local people call this the black slate. But when we look at this in thin section, and that's the real way, we see that a lot of the minerals are unmetamorpho uh, in, unmetamorphosed. And what makes this so hard and so slate-like is the fact that there's a lot of organic matter okay. binding this all together. Okay. And so it's a very tough rock. And by the way, this is a major source of oil for Kentucky. Okay. About 90% of Kentucky's oil comes from this very rock, or the rock of this very age. And this kind of black shale occurs all throughout eastern and uh, parts of south central and western Kentucky at some depth. Doesn't occur right at the surface, but if you're in, in the knobs in Kentucky, the knobs are largely made up of this black shale. Okay, well, let's move on up the cut. Well, Kim, we were in the Black Shales, and that represents the deepest water part of the, uh, of the sequence here. Maybe we're talking about things up, up to 800 feet deep, believe it or not, in these basal Black Shales. But as we move up here, uh, things are still dark colored, but you can see by looking at the way the shales weather, things are becoming more crumbly. And so that tells us that we're getting into things that have been bioturbated. There's more organisms living in them, and you can see thin layers, you can see the thin brown layers. Those are siltstones coming in as well, uh, telling us we're getting a little bit higher in the water column. Well, we're still in the Mississippian time period, Frank, but boy, this looks different from what you yeah. were standing on earlier. Yeah, this is really a different unit. We've come up through all those dark shales now, and now we have dark shales, but they're interbedded with thin siltstones. You can see uh, the kind of gray layers, sometimes they're kind of reddish. Those, in fact, are actually siltstones now. And well, we have alternating bands of mud and alternating bands of siltstone now. 
And Kim, we are actually been walking up the front of a delta. And although the land parts of the delta were, were much further to the east that way, we're actually down in deeper parts of the basin here. And every one of these layers of siltstone represents an influx of sediment, uh, a rather sudden influx oftentimes. And so each layer represents an influx. Sometimes there, they were storms. Sometimes there were probably uh, things that were carried down by gravity down the front of the delta. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kind of walking around here, looking, there's some really nice sedimentary structures over here that can help us interpret what's going on. Frank, uh, while we're walking over here, tell me a little bit about the differences in coloration. I know that's indicating different chemical composition, but what else does it tell us? Well, the, the, the dark colors generally are, are telling us that the iron is in a reduced state, and that's telling us that there probably isn't much in the way of oxygen. Okay. So we're in a, in a deeper water environment here. But when we move up toward the top, you see the rock starts to get a little bit redder in coloration. And although probably the depositional setting is the same, it's suggesting that we're bringing in red muds and sands from a place where they've been exposed to oxidation okay. and things of that sort. Now, Kim, this is what I wanted to show you right here. A couple things. If you look right here at this particular band of siltstone, and you can see there is kind of a series of swaley looking cross beds, and you see individual little laminae. Some of them are, are cutting off others. This is what we call hummocky cross bedding. Okay. And this tells us that this layer was probably brought in here and deposited by a storm event. So this single layer represents a storm. The storm carried this thing in off the shelf to the east, dumped it, and uh, it sat for a while. And after it sat, we get this mud deposition. This is the next siltstone event. Okay. Some of these siltstones also show us um, some other structures. And we might look at this piece right here. And you see at the bottom, we have little pebbles and clasts and things like this. When the storm or the gravity dumps these things in the basin, the coarsest things tend to settle out first. And then we get the finer grain things up. And this is called graded bedding. And this is also another one of these sedimentary structures that we use in helping us uh, determine the actual origin of these rocks. So it takes a lot more energy to carry these larger particles, therefore exactly. they get dropped first. Exactly, exactly. And as we move up in any one of these layers, the sediment becomes finer and finer, and eventually we get the mud, which is kind of the slow background sedimentation that occurs every time off the front of this delta. Okay. Let's walk back out here, Frank. I know this is one of the areas you told us if we were going to find some fossil bodies, we might find some here. So yeah, let's look um, around a little bit. I saw something over here when we were walking by. We have, I think, two, two general kinds of fossils that we can look, look for in these rocks. This is one that's kind of interesting. Uh, you see things that kind of look like swaths of color. They look like burrows in there. And in fact, these are burrows. And uh, we have two general kinds of fossils. We have trace fossils and we have body fossils. And body fossils are at the actual remains of shell material or organism. And the trace is just an evidence that they were there. This was made by a worm. The worm is long gone, but he left this burrow that filled in with more oxidized sediment. So these are trace fossils. And they, you can see they penetrate the in individual layer. So the layer was laid down by a storm or a gravity event, and then the organism burrowed in from the top, uh, seeking organic matter that was uh, present in the sediment. Now we found another kind of fossil here. These are not the best, but these are some actual body fossils that we found on the bottom. Now this is the bottom of one of these layers, and we see the, the circular little thing right there, that's actually a, a, a stem fragment right there. That's actually a stem fragment from an organism called a crinoid. And there's some little round bulbous things right here that are probably clams. Now these animals were not living here. Again, this is the bottom of the bed, and so these were carried in by this storm, and because they're bigger fragments, they were dumped first on the bottom of the bed. So actually this should be like this, with this is the top, and this is the bottom. But this is the kind of body fossils that we're able to find in this, this particular unit. Not very good, 
but uh, they tell us that there were some organisms living someplace probably further to the east. What well, other kinds of things besides clams and crinoids and things like that lived during this time period? Oh, there are a whole host of animals that living. We had uh, all sorts of echinoderms, again, crinoids. Stop. What is that? Okay, a echinoderm uh, is an, uh, name literally means a spiny skinned organism. Okay. We're talking about things like sea, uh, uh, sea stars, uh, brittle stars, uh, sea urchins, yeah, starfish. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, a crinoid, which probably most people probably haven't seen. Uh, we had clams, of course, which people have seen. We have snails. Uh, we also have a very common organism that looks like a, can a clam that's called a brachiopod. And maybe we'll see some brachiopods further up the hillside. And we have some corals, and we have some organisms that sometimes look like corals, but with very fine little holes that are called bryozoans. And why do these organisms leave fossils? Well, they all have hard parts. Okay. And to uh, be preserved as a fossil, generally you need two things. You need a hard part and you need to be buried rapidly. Okay. And so just like these organisms, they had hard parts. They were dumped in and buried by sediment very rapidly. And the hard parts aren't things that other organisms might eat? Generally not, okay. although there are some that nibble on hard parts too, but okay. generally not. Frank, where are we at right now in terms of geologic time? Well, we've moved up higher into the Mississippian at this point. Uh, we've moved up into uh, middle and upper parts of the Mississippian now, and you can see the rock type has changed drastically here. Well, it almost looks like it's cement. Well, it is. Uh, in <laughs> fact, they, they use this. this. is what they use to make cement. They take this and grind it up and bake it some in an oven, and that's exactly what they use to make cement. We're now in a dominantly limestone sec part of the section here. Uh, these were deposited in very shallow, open marine environments. Uh, much like we would expect to see in the Bahamas today. Okay. Uh, when we pick these up and check the mineral content, what would we expect to see here? Well, mineral-wise here, these rocks would be almost 100% calcite. We might have a little quartz coming in and things like that, but almost 100% calcite. So when we get up on the outcrop, we're going to want to pull out our acid bottle and see if we can get these rocks to fizz. Of course, if they're limestone, that's what they should do. They really should. Well, let's, there's an interesting feature up there. Why don't we move toward that? All right. And you talk about a geologic magnet. This brings geologists from all over the United States. <laughs> in we fact, ran across one. in fact, this is another geologist uh, from the University of Kentucky uh, who really just, just happened by just now. This is Steve Greb. Hello. Uh, he's uh, one of our adjunct professors in the geology department. He's also a researcher at the Kentucky Geological Survey. And Steve works quite a lot with teachers, actually. That's right. Well, oh boy, are we lucky. This couldn't have happened better if we had planned it. Really, people, this wasn't planned. No. <laughs> <laughs> this outcrop does draw people from all over uh, the eastern United States, though. Well, uh, it's easy to uh, see why with, uh, what, 1,700 feet of rocks just laid rocks out right, right, right in front of us all. Um, Steve, we came over here to look at this. What, what, what can you tell us about this? Okay, when we're in the limestone here, um, you're looking at places where the limestone has been eroded. And you'll see these big tubes cut into the side of the rock, and there's a whole series of them in this part of the limestone. And this is from groundwater that's moved through cracks in the rock, and the groundwater is slightly acidic. And then the, this limestone, uh, as Frank just mentioned, dissolves in acid. And this is places where along a fracture, the water has moved down and actually dissolved a whole lot of the rock. There's a whole cave system that actually works back through the mountains here. And it's connected by a whole series of these tubes. They're just big tubes in the rock, essentially, where the water's dissolved the limestone right away naturally. Well, Steve, uh, can you tell us where does the acid come from that does this? Well, the acid comes from several different places. One of the uh, ways in this area, it's from plants and the soil actually has acid, organic acid in it, and the water picks that up as it percolates through the soil, then goes down through the ground. Uh, in some areas, the rainwater actually carries a little bit of acid into it, and that comes down naturally over time, millions of years, carves holes like this. Well, well Kentucky's really well known for its cave system, so what kinds of things besides our particular um, rock composition lends itself to that. Why do we have more caves than other places? Well, that's a really good question. Part of it is the climate 
that we're in, where we have a certain amount of rainfall during the year, and we have so much limestone that's at the surface. A lot of places don't have the limestone that's at the surface. Also, to make the cave, you usually need some type of cap rock. So it's kind of the layering of the limestone and the other rocks to let the water get along one surface, for instance, for a long way to make a big hole for a long distance. For instance, in this outcrop, you can see, if you, when, if you step back, you'd see a whole series of these kind of heading right up the mountain. They're all in one layer. And there's some of these tannish layers in here that are actually a rock called dolomite. It's another kind of carbonate. Limestone is a sedimentary rock that is a carbonate. Dolomite is another kind of carbonate. And that forms a little resistant ledge. And the water got trapped along there until it hit a fracture. And then it came down and basically ate away the rock underneath it. And it just heads right up the mountain like that. Now, Steve, if I wanted to tell the difference between the dolomite and the limestone, what would be the easiest way for me to do that? It won't fizz as easy. That's probably about the easiest. Here, the color is a little bit different. So the yellowish, tannish color versus the gray is the easy way at this outcrop. But also, if you scratch it and you fizz it, it won't fizz as much as the limestone will. Now, the color of a rock, that's an interesting point, isn't usually one of the best qualities to use to identify it, is it? No, no, that can, that's one of the trickiest things because it's very easy to look at rocks and say, oh, this color and this color, but the same crystal, for instance, could have four or five different colors, and it's the same kind of mineral. Rocks are the same way. This is a really good example of that, too, in that if you look back this way, this rock is all gray, and then you come to right where the, the cave is here, and it's brown and orange. There's some reds in there, darker browns. That's just mineral staining on the rock. The rock right. itself hasn't changed, but the color has dramatically changed. And even, you know, as Steve was pointing out about the dolomite, we look at this little uh, vertical column here, and you can see the limestone has dissolved out quite nicely, but we have this ledge of dolomite going right across it that was not dissolved away. Why would that happen? Well, as Steve said, the dolomite is, is, does not dissolve quite as easily. It's the same thing if you took the acid bottle on it. Okay. It wouldn't fizz away as easy, well, so it makes a little bit more resistant. Steve mentioned the acid. Let's, let's give it the acid test. Yes, I got do. some of my own acid here. Okay. And let's go up and let's get a piece of the limestone. And let's try the acid on it and see what happens. Whoa, oh, look at that. Big difference. Now, Steve's bringing a piece of dolomite here, and this dolomite should, should not fizz as violently. Now, I, I suspect it's going to fizz a little bit, but it shouldn't be quite so violently. Well, yeah. It's hard to see. Very say. little, very little fizz to that. Now, another way we test for dolomite is if we take something like a hammer and we powder it. If I can powder it. Now, having powdered that and I put some acid on it, that should now fizz a little more violently than it did before. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost like the limestone did. And since they're cousins, so That's to speak, right. yeah. that would be what you would expect. So this is, um, we have limestones pretty much uh, throughout much of Kentucky. And many of these limestones, as we said before, were deposited in very sh shallow environments very warm environments, pretty much like what we see today in parts of southern parts of Florida and in the Bahamas. And in fact, we every other year, we take our students down to the Bahamas to look at the very types of environments where these things were deposited. Well, Frank, are we still in the Mississippian time well, frame? Well, we're still in the Mississippian, but we're moving up out of the carbonates now. And you can see we got a lot of shales and uh, some of these dolomites we talked about, we're getting more and more landward. In other words, we're getting shallower as we moved up. But I wanted to stop here real quickly because I got a pet rock here, very a, favorite rock. A pet it, rock. It's got some really nice fossils in it that I wanted to show you all. And uh, got to stoop down to see it. But this is one of these rocks from the upper part of the limestone sequence. And you can see some beautiful body fossils. These are some of the brachiopods we were talking about. And the rock is just littered. In fact, we, we'd probably call this a brachiopod hash. There's so many brachiopods in Lots there. Lots of little ones over here. Yeah, a lot of fragments and things. And we can see what they look like on the surface view. And then I just picked up this slab right here. And interestingly, this slab has them in a cross section. So we can see what these things look like. And we can see that they have two valves. Now, 
most people might think that these are clams, but in fact, there's something a little bit different than clams. They still live today, but they're not common. But we can see the cross sections. You can see how many of them. There must be about 20 of these things in this small piece of limestone. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, these uh, limestones were, uh, uh, were represent clear, shallow waters, and these critters like to live in them. And almost any place we'd see limestones, we might see very fossiliferous uh, settings like this. Uh, but it's, uh, unfortunately, in these new cuts, we have so many vertical exposures, it's difficult to get nice flat surfaces and nice clean cuts like this where you can see them. Well, we've walked around the bend, and, and it's kind of amazing to me to think about the thickness of this particular part of the Mississippian time period. I mean, when you think about how many layers were put down and how long a time frame we're taking to do it, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, and uh, each of these layers uh, might have been deposited over a very small period of time, believe it or not, but the, uh, oftentimes the largest amount of time is represented by the bedding planes between the layers. And we often find that something like this might have been deposited almost instantaneously within a couple hours, but it might have taken several hundred years before the next layer on top of it was deposited. So sometimes the rocks themselves are deposited in a very short period of time, and a lot of the time is taken up on bedding planes where nothing happens. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. But geologic record is a little bit different sometimes than we often think. And it's, uh, the more we look into it, the more surprises we find, especially about the time. Um, so. One other question for you, Frank, while we're here with these brachiopods. Where else would you uh, expect to find out of this particular road cut um, this kind of a uh, environment for formation? Was most of Kentucky uh, littered with the brachiopod fossils? or? Yeah, um, actually, brachiopods are a common component in a lot of the rocks in Kentucky. Now, the oldest rocks, of course, are in the bluegrass area, and their brachiopods are very abundant in the bluegrass area. And basically, they're common throughout the entire state. Wherever we find limestones or even, even shales or a little bit calcareous, we're very likely to find brachiopods. So they're one of the most common fossils in the state. Okay. Boy, this is brightly colored. Why is that, Frank? Yeah, we're in, a, in another uh, formation now. We're up above those Mississippian limestones. We're still in Mississippian age rocks, but we're becoming more and more shallow as we move up, up the section. And the colors have to do with that. And uh, what's probably happened here is the sea came in, deposited these rocks, and then the sea withdrew. And when the sea withdrew, these rocks were all exposed to the air. And when they were exposed to the air, actually, they oxidized and turned this red color. Because normally, these would be kind of a green or a dark gray color. We see this nice red oxidized color. That tells us they were exposed. And actually, these are fossil soils, which we, we call paleosols. And it tells us just that, that the sea withdrew and exposed the land to oxidation. OK. A couple of points, Frank. One thing that we've noticed as we've been walking up this cut is that there are a lot of vertical lines, and I guess that the viewers probably should recognize that those are not natural formations. Yeah, um, if you see vertical lines that have kind of a, a cylindrical cross section, those are actually bore holes. And uh, they have machines that bore those holes in, they fill them with explosives, and that's how they blast the rocks off the front of the, the cut fill those holes with dynamite and blow them out. In fact, we kind of uh, funnily call those dynamites. <laughs> They're kind of human trace fossils. OK. And the other comment I would make is about the, the caves that we observed earlier. Um, they are large enough that, it, and as Steve pointed out, they, they do have a networking system, but um, they, you wouldn't want to go back and, and investigate them. No, th these caves are really quite dangerous, and that's why they've cemented them in. Uh, unfortunately, they were not as thorough as they could have been in doing that. And just last week, a geologist, believe it or not, from, from uh, University of Tennessee got caught down in one of those caves, and they had to call the emergency services to get him out. And so, by all means, uh, don't try going down into these caves without proper equipment or 
some knowledge of what's going on because they're really dangerous and you can use your, lose your life. This is another one of these soils. We're up a little bit higher than where we were before, but the neat thing about it is that we can actually see that there were plants living here at one time because we actually have preserved fossil root tubes. And you see this vertical tube-like structure coming down here. Here's another one. Here's yet another one. Here's another one. Here's a real big one, kind of tilted. But these are fossil root tubes, and they're evidence that plants were actually living on this soil at one time. What time period are we in now, Frank? We're in the late Mississippian again, and we're getting even shallower. As we go up, we're getting more and more shallow every time. This is probably a lagoonal or estuarine, a, a river valley that's been flooded. And periodically, the seas withdrew. And when they withdrew, this was all exposed. And plants lived on it. And it's kind of dark in color because it's probably a pretty swampy looking condition. Now, every once in a while, the sea came back in. And we have another black shale here that's right on the top of the soil. And I don't know if you can see, but there are little white spots in there. Yeah, take up little white spots. And these are fragments of brachiopods that were living in this. Now, I can try to split this, and we'll see if we, we luck out and get some better ones. Oh, yeah. There we go. And you can see here we have some brachiopods and some clams. And we're starting to get rained on as well. Uh, but these are some of the fossils that lived in these shallow lagoons when the water was in. So we have a soil, sea left, and then right on top of it, we have this little black shale, and that signifies the sea coming back in again. So you can see by, by looking at the nature of the layers and how they change, we can tell how environments move in and out through time. And we are at the last stop. We're at the top of uh, Pound Gap, and we're at the place actually where we started, and we're at the youngest rocks in the outcrop. These are Pennsylvanian rocks and they're mostly sandstones, very coarse grain sandstones. And um, as you look at these things, you see there are nice kind of diagonally oriented beds. These are actually cross beds, and they tell us that we had large dunes migrating across the bottom of river valleys. These are actually giant uh, sediments deposit in very large, shallow rivers. In fact, this surface right about at your eye height, Kim, this is probably the bottom of a river channel. And we see several channels because we know that these river channels move uh, in time. The rivers meander around. This one was probably meandering around as well. Uh, at the bottom of some of these channels, we have quartz pebbles sometimes. And we also commonly get plant fragments because we know in floods, these rivers carry trees and things that are washed down the river. And right here, is a nice example of some of the plant material that was found. I will bring this up a little closer so the camera can see this. And also, fortunately, move toward the car where we can get <laughs> key from getting drowned. <laughs> OK. And what kind of fossil fragments are these? Well, but what you're looking at right now here, these are fragments of tree trunks that were transported, being transported in this river. And you also see some of the conglomeratic pebbles in fact, if we turn this over, I think, well, yeah, here's some more. See the, the uh, outline or the impression of the bark on these trees. So when we find large tree trunks like this in these quartz-rich conglomeratic sediments, we know we're dealing basically with uh, river-based river sediments. Well, Frank, I'm really glad we had this opportunity today. I know that I couldn't bring my personal class out here after a three and a half hour drive, uh, it's a little difficult to get that accomplished in a school day. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of classrooms around the state. I would agree. We can get away with it in college, but uh, maybe a little bit more difficult for you to, to do this. So one of the goals that we hope to accomplish today was to bring this to your classroom. So I hope that you found it informational and helpful. And um, I'm thankful that you had the opportunity to share this with us.